Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to this channel, please click like and subscribe so you can have updates and videos regarding recovery. I share tips, experiences, and some stories that I encounter along my journey while working as an overseas trained nurse in the UK. So for today's video, I'm going to share the handover that we receive and give in theaters and to the ward practitioners. Let me begin with the handover that we receive from anesthesia post-operatively. As I've mentioned in my previous videos, in the UK, or in my local trust at least, we receive the handover directly from the anesthetist. So after the operation, we usually fetch the patient. Fetch. We usually go to the theater suite via the anesthetic room and help transfer the patient into the recovery bay. So as part of our handover, the anesthetist will start with the patient's details, such as the name, preferred name if there is, the patient's age, and what was the history of present illness or what was the reason why the patient underwent the surgery and then the anesthetist will continue with the patient's past medical history including past medical conditions past surgical history if there are and most important to us is the current medications the patient is taking and if there is any food or drug allergies so while the anesthetist is verbalizing all of these we counter check with the documents that he will give for example the anesthetic chart or the prescription chart although the anesthetist hands over these details it's still important for us to double check with the patient once he is awake or if that is not possible we double check with other documents included in the patient's files and the next thing that the anesthetist is going to tell you is the name and lateralization of the surgery and what type of anesthesia he used during the surgery you will also be informed of the induction agents antibiotics and pre-operative medications that were given to the patient so usually these are uh, weak analgesics such as paracetamol anti-emetics such as ondansetron or dexamethasone. In some cases, although this is not really common unlike in the Philippines, they also administer preoperative antibiotics as prophylaxis. So most common antibiotics that you will encounter are fluclocsacillin and gentamicin. So for the recovery nurse, aside from making sure that you understood the names of these drugs that were given, you also have to be aware and ensure that the time that these drugs were last given are all documented somewhere, especially in the anesthetic chart or if they're not in the anesthetic chart double check in your prescription chart because sometimes they write it as stat doses you also have to ask and he said this if for example he doesn't mention it regarding fluids that were used during the operation how many liters were administered and if he is expecting another bag or another liter to be administered after that again you have to double check these are all documented in the patient's anesthetic chart or in the fluid balance chart next the anesthetist is going to inform you of any issues that they encounter during the surgery for example difficulty intubating or extubating or if the patient has a high malampati score difficult cannulation and therefore the need to insert a central venous line so all of these again you have to ensure that you are familiar you are aware you know how to look for them where they are located and that they are properly documented in the patient's files next after we receive handover from the anesthetist usually they will leave because they need to prepare for the next surgery so the other person who gives handover to us is the scrub practitioner now what are the things that the scrub practitioner hands over to the recovery staff so number one the patient's details again to this is just to verify that they are handing over the right patient and next thing is the name and laterality of the surgery you would hear something like okay uh, jet i'm handing over robert white he he likes to be called bob he's 57 years old and he just underwent left total hip replacement and next thing that the scrub practitioner is going to tell you is the name the type and amount of local infiltration that they used for example uh, five mils of 20 percent carocaine next he will also inform you the amount of estimated blood loss during the surgery so you will be aware if there's a need to replace the blood loss or if there's a need to increase the rate of the fluids 
Aside from these things, he will also inform you of the patient's position and any equipment or any device that they use to assist in positioning the patient on operating table. And also the use of diathermy and tourniquet. What was the duration of the tourniquet and where was it applied? It could either be monopolar or bipolar and if applicable, the duration of intermittent pneumatic compression devices such as Floatron boots used for VTE prophylaxis. So for specific types of surgeries where certain things need to be excised or taken out, the sub practitioner is also going to inform you about the uh, specimen taken, the number or quantity of this specimen and its location. So as I've mentioned in the previous, in one of my previous videos before, it's not the recovery practitioner who is in charge of sending the specimen to the laboratory. So it's actually the scrub practitioner's responsibility to secure the specimen, but it is the porter who takes the specimen to the laboratory for histology or for further studies. It's also important that the scrub practitioner has to inform you about any areas of redness or potential bed sores because you might get in trouble for that if you fail to spot them before handing the patient over to the ward. So each time you have to confirm with the scrub practitioner where the redness is located and was it there before the surgery or was it a new onset or simply because of the surgery itself. You have to make sure that these are documented and ask the scrub practitioner what was the action taken after noting these areas of redness. So common areas of skin um, ulcers or pressure ulcers are the patient's sacrum, occiput, elbows, heels, and all bony prominences. Next, the scrub practitioner is also going to inform you about any drains, packs, or catheters in situ. So as the scrub practitioner tells you these things, you have to make sure that you see them as well. So it's better that you confirm the presence and the location of, of these things with the scrub practitioner beside you before you let him leave the recovery bay. So make sure that when you do check these things, you have to maintain the patient's dignity and privacy at all times. Next, the scrub practitioner is also going to tell you details about dressing and types of skin closure that were used for the surgery. For example, is it an absorbable suture or a non-absorbable suture? This will be the basis for the follow-up appointment later on. And lastly, although this is not common, the scrub practitioner may also hand over details such as safety or safeguarding issues. And again, if there's this type of concern, you have to ensure that these are well documented and you have to know what was the action done after knowing these concerns. What are the things that we hand over to the ward nurses? As soon as we've transferred the patient to his bay or to his room and, ins and ensured that the bed is at its lowest position, the side rails are down, call bell is given, and all other concerns have been addressed, we start the handover by stating the patient's name, age, preferred name sometimes. We will continue with the name of surgery, laterality, and the type of anesthetic that were used that was used. For example, is it a general anesthesia or a spinal anesthesia or a combination of that? Or if there's a regional block, where or what type of block was used? For general anesthesia, I've also developed this habit of informing the ward nurses of um, maintenance agents such as propofol or midazolam so they will know uh, how much was given and also as a precaution for them how sleepy the patient could be. Next we will then uh, inform or hand over uh, the patient's history of present illness, past medical history including medical problems, surgeries that he had in the past, current medications, and of course drug or food allergies. And I forgot to mention, whenever, if the patient has indeed a drug or food allergy, you have to ask and you have to make sure that this is documented, what is the reaction of the patient to that agent or to that medication? Next, we will inform the ward nurses of the estimated blood loss what was the type of sutures and dressing if there's any packs, drains, or catheters in situ. In connection to that, we also inform the ward nurses if the patient has an IV cannula in situ, if there's an ongoing fluid replacement, or if there's an ongoing IV infusion. So we usually show them fluid balance chart. What's the name of the fluid? 
its quantity and uh, what time we started this fluid. But most of the time, we usually transfer the patients from recovery with no ongoing IV infusion. We, we just leave the IV cannula inside, make sure that it's been flushed before we transfer the patient. And the bulk of our handover probably is the plan of care for this patient. So the order of the plan of care usually starts with any investigations that the surgeon wants, such as electrolyte levels, sometimes whole blood count, um, ECG, and x-ray. We also inform the nurses of VTE prophylaxis, such as use of Clexane or Dabigatron, what is the dosage and what is the due time, if the patient is wearing TEDs or anti-embolic stockings, or if he has been prescribed with Flotrons or intermittent pneumatic compressions. Third, antibiotics if there are further doses given. So if there are, we usually inform the nurses of the last dose that was given. What was what time was the antibiotic last given? Next, if the patient has a catheter, we also inform them of how long will the catheter remain in situ. So in other words, when will the patient undergo a trial without catheter or talk? Usually 48 or 72 hours. Next, if there's a schedule for a wound review or removal of sutures or clips, of course, these are only applicable if the patient has non-absorbable sutures. So if the patient has Vicryl or any other absorbable sutures, naturally, there's no removal of sutures. In connection to the suture, sometimes your patient can also benefit from change of dressing. So we inform the ward nurses uh, how soon the dressing could be changed or how would they address the need for dressing changes. Usually we don't change dressings, we could only reinforce them because during the first 24 hours post-op, it's usually the surgeon who is responsible for changing the dressing if needed. Next, if there's a clinic appointment or a follow-up, so we have to tell the details such as where, what, which clinic, when will it be, how many weeks afterwards, or how many months, whichever is applicable. It's not recovery who arranges these appointments, it's usually ward clerks, unless it's a patient-initiated follow-up, which is, of course, it's the patient's responsibility. And finally, if the patient is for discharge, whether it is a doctor-initiated or nurse initiated. If the patient is indeed for discharge, we ensure that we have a copy of the discharge summary, especially medications to take out. Uh, we ask the surgeons to write up or accomplish a sick note for their patient. It's one less thing that the ward nurse will have to think about. So those are the things that we receive and give during handovers. I hope I have given you um, a good picture on how we work in recovery. So these things that I've told you may or may be different from your current practice, but this is how we do it in my local trust. So thank you again for watching this vlog. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing so that I will see you next time. Bye bye.